For our Members in Action segment tonight, we're going to have a testimony by Bill Gamblin. Come on up, Bill. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> How many here believe in miracles? You know, we're all miracles, <laughs> or we wouldn't be here. But uh, the Lord has uh, been a very, has uh, <laughs> been very patient with me. And before I get started, could we, do you mind if I have a prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, so much for this time that I can get up and give a testimony of the things that you have done in my life. Where I was lost and going right straight to hell. But you pulled me out of that fire. And we thank you. We want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory tonight. For the Amen. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Even the people in the back? Yes. Excellent. Is it really me already? I thought it's quarter past. So I've got five minutes extra. Okay. <laughs> All right, before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, without you, we can do nothing. And we need your protection and your guidance and your spirit amongst us. And so we invite your mighty angels to walk up and down these passages, keep away anything that should not be here, and uh, enlighten our spirits with your mind so that we may have the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> what do people do if they go to war? They train, they prepare, and is it necessary for them to know what the enemy is doing? Well, imagine going to war having no clue who the enemy is or what he's doing. Wouldn't that be kind of silly? And yet, we are told we shouldn't dwell on these issues. All we need is the love of Jesus. And we need to preach the love of Jesus. And I agree, we have to preach the love of Jesus. But sometimes the love of Jesus is so buried under the rubbish of theology that nobody loves Jesus anymore. And they become atheists like me because Jesus is a monster who's going to boil everyone for all eternity in a place that he invented just for such an occasion called hell. And these are all good theological summaries of the character of God. And so, if you go and preach to the outside world and you tell them Jesus loves you, is that going to convince a hardened atheist like the Dawkinses and the Hawkinses of this world? Is it going to convince them? No, they've already made their decision. But they made their decision based on false theology. They didn't make their decision based on the Bible. And the same when it comes to war. What do you do when you go to war? You plan, you strategize. And that's what we should also be doing. We must know the enemy, or the enemy will pull the wool over our eyes. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the enemy and how he thinks, because when you understand how he thinks, then you will be able to counter it and to survive the onslaught. Not, of course, without Jesus by your side. This one's called General Ricky's War. Now, who was General Ricky? General Ricky was the Jesuit general who ruled in the period just prior to 1798. It's a <coughs> We're going to cough a little bit, but just bear with me. General Ricky was 
supposedly a very soft-spoken, gentle little man. Anything but. A book appeared some years ago in that time period in French in the year 1772. And it was written by a French Jesuit named Jean-Joseph-Marie Amiot. He was the astronomer to the emperor of China. And this book was translated later into English, but only in 1905 did it really exist in the English language. And in 1910, another form of it was republished. But it was first published by a Jesuit who was the astronomer to the emperor of China. So he spoke perfect Chinese and French. <coughs> and the book is called The Art of War. Now you've probably all heard of this book. But one other interesting point is the timing when it comes out, 1772. And on page 490 of his book, The Jesuits, Malachi Martin implies that if a Jesuit writes a book, then it is in essence the Jesuit general who sanctions it because of the oath of obedience. So no Jesuit will do anything without the marching orders of his general. Now it's an amazing story, and most of you probably know it. Who's never heard of the Art of War book? Okay. How many of you know exactly what's in it because you've all read it? One or two. All right, so I better summarize it for you. If someone writes a book and he's a Jesuit, and he claims this is a true story, and he takes it from the legends, in actual fact, there's no evidence that there ever was such an individual as Sun Tzu, the general of this Chinese dynasty. Here you have an actual statue of Sun Tzu, the general. And the story goes that the Chinese king of Wu had a serious problem because he was being invaded by all the nations around. And the country was not coping, it was going under. And so a famous general by the name of Sun Tzu said to the king of Wu, <laughs> if you had me as your general, I would get your army in such a ship-shaped state that you would defeat any other enemy that ever existed. And the king of Wu, some call him King Wu, said, that's impossible. My country is ragtag. It's chaotic. You'll never be able to do this. And the general calmly said to him, yes, I can. And so he said to him, all right, I make a deal with you. If you can take my concubine wives, and he had probably about 140 of them, and change them into an organized army within one day, then you will be my general. So Sung Tzu said to, king, to the king of Wu, who some call Hu, I will do it on one condition, and that is that I have absolute authority. So the king thought about it. He was in serious trouble. His nation was going down, and he said, OK. You have absolute authority. So he got the concubines together, and he, they were all giggling and laughing. This was going to be fun. And Sung Tzu said to them, right, you will now line up in two camps. One this side, half of you this side, half of you that side, and the two favorite concubines or wives of the king will be your leaders. So you will face them, and they will give you orders that come from me. And then you will do exactly what is being told. Except I won't speak to you directly. I'll use a drum. Now you all stand in a perfect line, and I'm going to explain it to you. When the drum beats once, 
you all smartly, in unison, turn to the right. If the drum beats twice, or something like that, then you will all smartly turn to the left. If the drum beats three times, you'll turn right round facing the other side. Stone faced, nobody moves. That's military drill, that's how it'll work. They thought it was very hilarious, all started giggling. And he says, right, let's start. And he beat the drum once, boom. And they turned any which way. <laughs> and he said, let's try that again. And he beat the drum twice, and it was total chaos. He said to them, ladies, I want you to pay careful attention. Perhaps you misunderstood me. I'll explain it one more time. And he carefully explained the drum beats to them. Do you all understand? Yes, they said, we all understand. Murthy, Murthy, giggle, giggle. And he said, let's try that again. So he beat the drum once. And they turned any which way. And he did it another time and another time. And he explained it to them over and over and over, never losing his cool. And eventually he said, is there anybody here who does not understand the order? And they all agreed they understood. He said, fine. Then what we have is insubordination. That's high treason against the commanding officer of this unit. And the penalty for that is death. So the two leading ladies, the king's best concubines, his favorite wives, come here, you're going to be executed. So they ran to the king and they said, this guy's gone insane, he's gonna execute your favorite wives. So the king sent a message and says, stop, 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 you're not allowed to execute my favorite wives. And he calmly said, I have absolute authority. And he took his sword and he chopped off their two heads. And then he said, fine, out of this group, you come to the front and stand here. And out of that group, you come to the front and stand here. You're taking their place. Now, let me explain it to you. If the drum beats once, you turn to the right. If the drum beats twice, you turn to the left. If it beats three times, you turn right round smartly. Everybody understand? Yes. No mirth. No giggling. Just shock and horror. And the drum beat once. What do you think happened? It was the smartest right turn you had ever seen in any military. And the drum beat twice, and the drum beat three times, and there was total order. But the king was so devastated that he banned Song Tzu. And then his kingdom started crumbling, and more and more chunks out of the kingdom disappeared until the king in desperation said to Sung Tzu, all right, I capitulate. You can be the general of my forces. Same conditions? Yes. So, that's what they did. And eventually, Sung Tzu changed the picture and drove out the enemies and eventually totally obliterated every single enemy of the king of Wu. And he became very famous. This is the legend of Song Tzu. Now, this book was written by a French Jesuit, and it is probable that it is the blueprint of the Jesuit general's thinking. Because the king of Wu, in this acronym, is of course the Pope. And the papacy had lost one state after the other to Protestantism. And Protestantism was not only invading the mindset of Catholicism, but the various <coughs> kingdoms were separating. England had totally separated 
Jesuits were banned. They were nowhere allowed ever to put their foot into England. The Jesuits had tried to destroy the king and the parliament with a gunpowder plot, and it was under pain of death that they were there. Germany had thrown them out. The Dutch had thrown them out. The Czech Republic had thrown them out. So here he had a serious problem. And then he continued to say how a general acts. Now if we have this knowledge that a book written by the Jesuit has the sanction of the Jesuit general because it is the opinion and mind of the general, then we can learn from the strategy. Laying plans. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it would take too long. I'm just going to highlight a few points. All warfare is based on deception. That's the opening situation. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, he must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When we are far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out bait to entice the enemy. Attack him when he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. And then he says, the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. Question. A normal general in an army, let's say the army of the United States, does he make his decisions in his temple? Or does he make them in his fort or his garrison or his whatever? This general is different because he makes his plans in a temple. That's a bit of a giveaway, don't you think? Hence, a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to 20 of one's own. So when you want to wage a war, the best way to wage a war is to use the enemy to wage the war for you. Think of countries in the world today where there is chaos and war, and the country is making war on the country within the war, etc. Okay. And likewise, a single pickle of his provender is equivalent to 20 from one's own store. Now, in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger that there may be advantage from defeating the enemy. They must have their rewards. So you reward people that fight for you. The third point is attack by stratagem. Now, the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. Thus, we may know that there are five essentials to victory. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all ranks. If he has prepared himself, he can win. And he will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the sovereign. So, ge General is on his own. He doesn't have to listen to Obama. If Obama says, do this, he says, sorry, I won't, etc. But he can listen to me if he wants to. And then the fourth, tactical disposition. The good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands. But the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. His victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. Here's another giveaway. If a general in a regular army wins battles, doesn't he get accolades? Huh? 
who doesn't know about General Montgomery today? Or who doesn't know about the famous generals of the last wars? Or even the ones of the present? But this general gets no credit for his wisdom or his courage. This is a temple Jesuit. Sun Tzu said, the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. All right, now if you are supposed to use the enemy to fight against the enemy, what's the best strategy to do with the enemy? Divide up his numbers. Now, who was the enemy to Rome? Protestantism. What is the most divided organization on the planet today? Protestantism. Instead of one denomination of Protestants adhering to the Bible, there are 33,000 at least. 33,000. All at loggerheads with one another. Sun Tzu said, whoever is first in the field and waits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. You have to be the first in the field. You have to pull the, sh the strings behind the scenes, but they mustn't know it. They must think they are in control. So it's very important to be first in the field. So if you're going to set up a government system that is supposed to be at your disposal, but it's in the enemy's field because one cartload of theirs is worth 20 of your, of your own, then it would be wise if you were in the field when you are planning such a strategy. Okay. And then he says, O oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy. Now that's a very strange divine art because Jesus said, I have done nothing in secret. That's what Jesus said. If you want to know what I said, ask any of these. That's why I like saying, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, in the old days, nobody said that. Everybody said, well, you know, uh, well, uh, mm, yeah. No, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm proud of being a Seventh-day Adventist. And I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And I want to defend our doctrine against anyone. I'll do it in a public forum. I'll get a hall, I'll get a tent. Anybody can come and listen. doesn't matter. Why? Because we can defend what we believe from the Bible. Nothing to be ashamed of. We do nothing in secret. Nothing. It doesn't have to be secret. But this general, oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy. Maneuvering. Song Tzu says, in war, the general receives the commands from the sovereign. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night. And when you fall, when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. Boom. And then he says something very strange, variation in tactics. He says there are roads which must not be followed, etc. And commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. Now, this is very confusing to some people. Because they hear the Pope making a statement and they see the soldier doing exactly the opposite. For example, you will have the papacy officially declare that contraception is from the evil one. And the Pope will say, no contraceptions. And the Jesuits will hand out contraceptives in schools in a school program. And you're going, excuse me, what's going on here? This is strategy. It's planned strategy. The army on the march, if soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you, they will not prove submissive. Therefore, soldiers must be treated <coughs> in, the first <coughs> in the first instance with humanity but kept under control by means of iron discipline. 
A Jesuit swears to be perinde a cadaver, like a corpse in obedience. And even if a dog is given you as a general, Laiola said, you will not hesitate to obey him. And if he says it's black and you think it's white, you better believe it's black. Terrain. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbid it. If fighting will not result in victory, then you must not fight, even at the ruler's bidding. So who has the higher position when it comes to control? The general or the king? The general. The general is absolute in his authority. Absolute. 